Uh, all right, why don't we get started? Um, uh, as a quick note, uh, I just want to say, let everyone know that um, this lecture is being recorded. Um, uh, anyways, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center here at Western Washington University. Um, the ISC aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. Um, the lecture series is presenting leading scholars and practitioners whose work sort of challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. Um, a bit about our speaker today, um, Bruce uh, Schneier. It, he is uh, uh, an internationally renowned uh, security technologist and uh, was dubbed a security guru by The Economist. He's a New York Times bestselling author of 14 books including Click Here to Kill Everybody, as well as hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. Um, and his personal newsletter and blog is read by over two, 250,000 people. Uh, uh, Schneier is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and a lecturer in, the, uh, public pol and a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, if that's not impressive enough, he's also a board member of the Electronic Front, uh, Frontier Foundation, Access Now, the TOR Project, and uh, an advisory board member for the Electronic Privacy Information Center, uh, verifiedvote.org. And he is the chief of uh, security architecture at, at Interrupt Inc. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to uh, extend a, a warm welcome to Bruce. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you. And actually, even with all that bio, I am still bored out of my skull during this pandemic. So thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, most exciting thing that happened to me today is I now have just learned you can see 49 people on a Zoom screen, not just 25. I don't start teaching until tomorrow. So I didn't know this until just now. So I'm terribly excited, even though I have noticed as this pandemic increases, the number of students who do not share their video increases exponentially. I see two people sharing their video. I don't know what I'll get when I, there's three, there's four, and they're waving. That's interaction, right? Human contact. And someone's eating a sandwich. This is great. And if, uh, if we can see someone's cat walk by and someone's kid causing trouble, it'll be an actual class. So thanks for coming. Uh, Welcome to spring semester, or I don't know if you're winter quarter on Zoom. And uh, let's hope by, uh, by summer, by fall, we can actually do some things in person again. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, the security of, of everyday things. And this is actually from my book, which uh, you heard the, uh, the awesome title of Click Here to Kill Everybody. And what this book talks about is a world where everything is a computer. So, right, this is a, this smartphone is a small portable computer that happens to make phone calls. And to a very real extent, your refrigerator is a computer that keeps things cold and your microwave oven is a computer that makes things hot. And an ATM machine is a computer with money inside. Now, your car is a computer with four wheels and an engine. Actually, that's not entirely true. Your car is a 100-plus computer distributed system with four wheels and an engine. The things are becoming computers with different peripherals. This is more than the Internet. It's the Internet of Things, but it's more than the Internet of Things. It's, it's the objects, it's the networks, it's the connections, it's the data. I called it in my book, Internet Plus, which is a terrible name, and I'm sorry I did it, but there really isn't a name to talk about this interconnected, computerized world we're making. And this world means several things for, for people in my profession. It means that Internet security becomes everything security. And it means all the lessons from the world of Internet security become applicable to everything everywhere. So I want to start with six lessons of computer security, basically why computers are still hard to secure in six parts. 
less than one. Uh, most software is poorly written and insecure. So this is a basic truism. It is economics. We don't want to pay for quality software. Good, fast, cheap, pick two. Right? This works for restaurants. It also works for software. And we generally, in the market, choose fast and cheap over good. And you've all been reading about solar winds, the massive Russian hack into U.S. government and other uh, and corporations, other governments around the world. It's solar winds Orion was software that was designed to be fast and cheap. It was not designed to be secure. The economic model of that company was not to design secure software. And that's true basically across the board. Right? Poor software is full of bugs. Some of those bugs are security vulnerabilities. Some of those vulnerabilities are exploitable and some of those are exploited. In the case of SolarWinds Orion, it was a vulnerability. It was actually an interesting cascade, right? It was a vulnerability in this whole in the software update process that allowed the Russian SVR to install a backdoor into a SolarWinds update that they pushed out to 18,000 users worldwide. Kind of impressive. But that's the economics of software we have today. Lesson two. The internet was never designed with security in mind. Now, this is freaking crazy when I say it today. But if you go back to the early days of the internet, two things were true. One, the internet wasn't being used for anything important ever. And two, organizational constraints meant that there was limited access to who could be on the internet in the first place. And for those two reasons, there was a conscious decision to ignore security in building the internet and leave it to the endpoints. So the basic idea is the internet itself is open. If you want to build a secure app, you build that on top of the open internet. And we are still living with the effects of that decision today in the domain name system, in routing and packet security, and email addresses, on and on. These base internet protocols are insecure by design. And retrofitting security turns out to be harder than anyone thinks. Lesson three, the extensibility of computerized systems means that anything can be used against us. Now, extensibility is an important property of computers that pretty much nothing else we, we deal with shares. It means you can't constrain the functionality of a computer because it runs software. Right, so when I was a kid, there was a telephone in my house, big black thing attached to the wall with a cord, great device, weighed a ton. Uh, and no matter how hard you tried, it couldn't be anything other than a telephone. That's all it could do. That's all it ever was. This right, is a computer that makes phone calls. It can do whatever you want. And if you remember Apple's first slow marketing slogan for the iPhone, there's an app for that. You can download new functionality. You can make this do new things. It'll do new things tomorrow, right? more things than it did yesterday. So this is a continuously evolving system, much harder to secure because you don't know what it's going to do. Hang on. Right? The designers can anticipate every use, every condition, and every computer can be updated with additional features. And they can add in securities, right? SolarWinds Orion is an example of that, right? Attackers can add in securities by giving this device new features, right? They're not features I want or I paid for. It's malware. But because this is extensible, this can be hacked in that way. And this is why your refrigerator can be hacked to send spam. Or you can see denial of service attack against your car. Because they're computers and they're extensible. All right, lesson four. The complexity of computerized systems means that attack is easier than defense. Now, I can spend an hour on this point, but I'll, I'll sort of do it quick. Complexity is the worst enemy of security. In some ways, it's, it's the position of the interior. Right? The attacker has to find just one unsecured avenue for attack. The defender has to secure every possible attack. 
Complex systems have a larger attack surface, and they're harder to secure. The internet is basically the complex, most complex machine mankind has ever built by a lot. So it means that technically it is easier to attack than defend, and that testing is hard because you have to test for all possible attacks, and you can't ever possibly know that. Lesson five, there are new vulnerabilities in the interconnections. As we connect things to each other, vulnerabilities in one thing affect other things. Right, 2016, the Dyn botnet, this is vulnerabilities in DVRs and CCTV cameras, allowed hackers to launch massive DDoS attacks, took down a domain name server, dropped a bunch of popular internet sites. Right, uh, solar winds. Right? Here's a vulnerability in a piece of network management software. Actually, even worse, a vulnerability in the company that makes the network management software that allowed the hacker to get in, install a malicious update that got automatically downloaded and installed by 18,000 users. And you see this again and again. Uh, 2018, uh, the Las Vegas Casino, we don't know the name, unfortunately. Uh, they were hacked through a vulnerability, and oh, I'm not making this up, their internet-connected fish tank. Right? And vulnerabilities like this can be hard to fix, because sometimes no system is actually at fault. Lesson six, attacks always get better, easier, and faster. But some of this is Moore's law, computers get faster. A password that might have been secure 10 years ago is not secure today, not because we're smarter at password guessing, but we're just faster at it. But we also get smarter. Attackers get smarter, attackers adapt. There are these arms races in security. And you'll see them in know, spam versus anti-spam, deep fakes versus deep fake detection, ATM machine security versus ATM machine hacks. And expertise flows downhill. Right? Today's top secret NSA programs becomes tomorrow's PhD theses and the next day's hacker tools. The techniques we saw the Russian SVR use with solar winds are going to become common criminal tactics over the next few months. That's the way this works. So none of these lessons are new. These have all been around for years, for decades. And up to now, it's all been kind of a manageable problem. But now, for a confluence of reasons, we're reaching a crisis. And the one I want to talk about in particular is these, phys these, these physically capable computers. So auto automation, autonomy, and physical agency. Those three things bring new dangers. So traditionally, in computer security, we're concerned. Actually, let me say it this way. There's something called the CIA triad. It's not that CIA. It's a different CIA. It's the three properties that we are expected to provide as security professionals, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Traditionally, we are concerned with confidentiality. When you see a security story in the news, it is almost certainly a confidentiality story. Right? Solar winds is a data theft story. So privacy, data theft, data misuse. This is Equifax. This is that target hack I mentioned. This is the office personnel, office personnel management, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Somebody took your data and is doing something with it. But those aren't the only threats. Right? There are availability threats, a DDoS attack, ransomware. Nothing was stolen in ransomware, but you can't get access to your data. Your data is no longer available. Right? There are integrity threats. You hack a bank, change a bunch of balances in some spreadsheet somewhere. You didn't take any data, but you just made some money. That's, a, that's an integrity threat. And I argue today that the integrity and availability threats are much worse than the confidentiality threats. Right? The effects are much greater. There are real risks to life and property. So I'm concerned if someone hacks a hospital and steals my confidential medical records but I'm much more concerned if they change my blood type. Right? That is a data integrity attack. And I don't want someone to hack my car and eavesdrop on the conversations using the Bluetooth microphone. But I'm much more concerned if they remotely disable my brakes. That is a data availability attack. So when you think of 
cars, medical devices, drones, weapon systems, thermostats, power plants, smart city systems. We worry about DDoS attacks against the power grid. We worry about ransomware on your car. And there's a fundamental difference between your computer crashes and you lose your spreadsheet data and your pacemaker crashes and you lose your life. And it could be the exact same CPU and operating system and application software and vulnerability and attack tool and attack. The only thing different is what the computer is attached to and what it can do. And these trends are even more dangerous as our systems become more critical. So I have a seventh lesson, is that computers fail differently. They all work perfectly until one day when none of them do. And this is important. Right? So think about a car. You know, we all know how cars work. Cars have parts. These parts have some mean time between failures. And there's an ecosystem of car repair shops in my neighborhood and your neighborhood to handle the steady state of autos that need repairing throughout their life cycle. Right? Computers don't fail that way. Again, they all work perfectly until one day when none of them do. So we worry about things like crashing all the cars, shutting down all the power plants. There's a real example of this. Uh, there's a company called Amity. They make keyless entry systems for hotels and other buildings. And you, everyone remembers hotels and used to stay at hotels. You get a key card at the desk and you'd wave it in front of a reader at your door and then the door would open. So several companies make that system. Amity is one of them. Uh, a few years ago, a vulnerability was found in one of Amity's major systems. And the way you repaired it is you had to upgrade the firmware, which means you had to go to every door manually and update the software. Now, hotels have some mechanism for dealing with broken locks. I'm gonna make it up. They have a locksmith on call. There's a problem with a lock. They call the locksmith, the locksmith comes and I don't know, rehangs the door or fixes the lock or jiggles whatever needs to be jiggled. They do not have a mechanism for all 600 of our hotel rooms at once are broken. And that means in most cases, the vulnerability was never repaired because they weren't able to handle the failure mode of a computer. So at the same time of all of this, some of our longstanding security systems are failing. I wanna talk about three of them. The first one is patching. So patching is starting to fail. Let me talk about patching a bit. The reason our, actually, our computers and phones are as secure as they are for two reasons. One, engineers at Microsoft and Apple and Google doing their best to design them to be secure in the first place. And two, those teams are able to quickly and effectively deliver software patches when someone finds a vulnerability. Right? That's the way the system works. We don't know how to design it secure up front, so we patch quickly. And that works pretty well. Uh, this is not true for low-cost embedded systems like DVRs or home routers. They're built at a much lower profit margin, often built offshore by third parties. They don't have dedicated security teams associated with those devices. Even worse, many of them have no way to patch their software or firmware. And right now, the way you update your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's the mechanism, we don't have another. And actually, oddly enough, that, that, that works because we also get the security from, from the fact that we replace our computers and phones every few years. But that's not true for embedded systems. You buy a DVR, it's gonna last, what, five to 10 years? A new refrigerator, 25 years? And I bought a home thermostat a few years ago. I expect to replace it approximately never. And this is gonna be a problem, right? I mean, imagine, okay, you buy a car today. I'm gonna make this up. Your, the software, let's say, is two years old. You drive it for 10 years, sell it. Somebody else buys it. They drive for 10 years. They sell it. This point is probably put on a boat, send it somewhere in Latin America, where someone else buys it, drives another 10 to 20 years. Okay, 
You try to find a computer from 1979. Try to boot it up. Try to make it run. Try to make it secure. We have no idea how to maintain 40-year-old consumer software. There is a reason that Microsoft and Apple depreciate their operating systems after a few generations. It's too hard to maintain the old stuff. And this problem is even worse for low-cost consumer devices. Companies go out of business or change product lines. Right? The market's not going to fix that because neither the buyer nor the seller care very much at the point of purchase. So that's my first problem with patching. Second was authentication, which has kind of only just barely worked ever. Right? Human memorizable passwords no longer work in some situations. Two-factor authentication isn't suitable in other situations. Backup authentication systems are terrible. And the amount of authenticating that's going to happen is about to explode exponentially. So I will demonstrate authentication. I will demonstrate two different authentications. Okay, first, okay, I authenticated to my phone. I used Face ID. And now I authenticated, I just downloaded my email. I authenticated to a remote email server. Right, so that is me authenticating to an object and me authenticating to a remote service. What we are going to see the rise of is thing-to-thing -thing authentication. The explosion in IoT devices means objects are going to be talking, of, talking to each other behind our backs without our knowledge. That's the whole point of 5G. It's actually not for you to watch Netflix faster. It's for the Internet of Things to talk to itself. And this explodes, right? You have 100 IoT devices needing to talk to each other. That's 10,000 authentications. You have 1,000 devices. That's a million authentications. We do not know how to authenticate things at that scale. We have a basic system, right? Right now, you know, when I uh, get into my car, this device will automatically authenticate to the, to the car, right? And then uses the microphone and speakers. We all know how that works. That's Bluetooth. Now, if you remember Bluetooth, you had to set that up manually. And you'll do that 10 times. You'll do that 25 times. You're not doing it 1,000 times. You're not doing it a million times. Right? That's not the way it's going to work at scale. And we actually don't have a good answer here. Third problem is supply chain security, which is an insurmountably hard problem. It's solar winds is an example of that. Now, all of the companies, all the government organizations, all the NGOs that were hacked by the Russians were not hacked directly, were hacked indirectly through a product that they used. And this, is, this has been a problem for years. In the past couple of years, it was all about Chinese networking equipment, Huawei, ZTE. A few years ago before that, it was about Kaspersky. Can we trust a Russian-made antivirus product? This is not actually not just the US. In 2014, uh, China banned Kaspersky and also Symantec, a US company. 2017, India banned a bunch of Chinese smartphone apps. Back in 1997, I remember debates in the United States about a company called Checkpoint. Can we trust an Israeli security company? And 2008, uh, a program, Mujahideen Secrets, ISIS made because, of course, you can't trust Western encryption programs. So this is actually a real question. Can you trust a product or service which is housed in a country whose government you don't trust? Important question. But that's just the beginning of a very complex problem. right? This is a U.S. product, but it's not made in the U.S. Its chips aren't fabbed in the U.S., its programmers carry 100 plus different passports. And this can be subverted so many ways through the supply chain. We have discovered backdoors in Juniper firewalls and D-League routers, both American companies. 2003, it's worth looking up if you care. Someone almost slipped a very clever backdoor into the Linux distribution, and we got lucky and caught it. Right, there's more. You have to trust your distribution mechanism. We've seen fake apps in the Google Play Store. You have to trust your update mechanism. SolarWinds, yes, but not Petya, was distributed through a fake update of a popular Ukrainian accounting package. 
You have to trust your shipping mechanism. One of the NSA documents showed, uh, sorry, one of the Snowden documents showed NSA employees putting a back door into a Cisco router destined for the Syrian telephone company. So a paper a few years ago, you can hack a smartphone through a malicious replacement screen. But basically, you can't trust anyone, yet you must trust everyone. And we have no good answer to this. I mean, watch the next few months. Biden talked about securing the U.S. against supply chain attacks like solar winds. This is way harder than he imagines. And my guess is we'll do little because it is so hard, because it is so expensive. So this is, a, I think, a perfect storm. Security is failing just as everything is becoming connected. And we've been OK with an unregulated tech space because it fundamentally didn't matter. And this is no longer sustainable. So I think this is a primarily this is a policy problem. And getting the policy right is critical. I mean, if you heard the intro, I teach cybersecurity at a public policy school. Right? I'm not teaching computer scientists. I'm teaching policy grad students enough tech to hopefully understand these problems. Because getting the policy right is critical. And law and tech have to work together. This, to me, actually is the most important lesson of Edward Snowden. We all knew that technology could subvert law. What his document showed is that law can also subvert technology, and both have to work. So this really is the topic of this book, and I spend a bunch of time on solutions, standards, regulations, liabilities, international treaties and agreements, a bunch of stuff. I want to mention two of them, one policy, one technical. The policy principle is defense must dominate. We actually have to choose between offense and defense. And as these devices become more critical in our infrastructure, we need to choose defense. Right? One world, one network, one answer. Gone are the days when we can defend our stuff and attack their stuff. That worked during the Cold War. But today, everyone uses the same stuff. We all use iPhones and Microsoft Windows and TCP IP and PDF files. And basically, either security for everyone or security for no one. Or to put it another way, either everyone gets to spy or no one gets to spy. And as long as this thing is in the pocket of every single elected official and police officer and judge and election official and CEO, this needs to be secure, even if the bad guys get to use it too. And there's an example after example of that. We need to design for security and not for surveillance or attack. This is critical. One technical principle is to build in resilience. Assume insecurity and design systems that work anyway. A bunch of pieces of this and, and the, the kind of standard ways that we're doing security, defense in depth, compartmentalization, avoiding single points of failure, ways to fail safe, fail secure, removing functionality, deleting data, systems that monitor other systems, audits. I mean, look at how FireEye discovered the solar winds attack. They were auditing their own systems after an intrusion. There's a lot more here. The real question to me is how to get from here to there. Because mar this is not something that markets can solve. Markets are short-term and profit-motivated at the expense of society. When you look at the company SolarWinds, they are a private equity-funded company. And the business model of that private equity firm is to wring as much expense out of, out of a company as possible to maximize profits. To a very, in a very real way, SolarWinds increased the risk of its products by underspending on security and then secretly push that risk onto its customers without telling them. Because that's the way private equity works. Right? They care about short-term profits. Markets also can solve collective action problems. 
right? And increasing security is expensive. No one wants to pay it. Everyone wants the results. No one wants to pay it. Markets are a race to the bottom. They need, this needs a race to the top. And government is the entity we use to solve problems like this. I like to think government is how we act collectively as citizens and not individually as consumers. And sometimes we need to act collectively as citizens. And of course, there's a lot of problems here. It is very hard for governments to be proactive. We are terrible at proactivity. Regulatory capture, the real problem between security versus safety. Like there's a difference between a static safety environment like uh, hurricanes and intelligent and adaptive human adversary. Like hurricanes don't get smarter and adapt depending on your hurricane defenses, whereas human adversaries do. Right. And the problem, of course, of regulating security in a fast moving technological environment. So the devil's in the details, and I don't have them, but the alternative isn't viable any longer. And here's the thing governments will get involved regardless. The risks are too great, and the stakes are too high. Governments are already involved in physical safety cars, planes, consumer goods. The physical threats of the IoT will spur them to action. So what I tell people, especially if I'm talking to uh, you know, small L libertarian audiences, that your choice is no longer between government involvement or no government involvement. Your choice is between smart government involvement and stupid government involvement. And you need to start thinking about the pros and cons and how to do this right so you're not surprised. Pushback you get is that regulation will, sti will uh, stifle private, it will stifle innovation. Uh, it's a threat you always hear when everyone talks about regulation. Near as I can tell, it's never true. You, I've heard it with restaurant sanitation codes, automobile safety. There's no actual evidence. And good regulation and sense private industry. So here's my problem here. I have a lot of security technologies. I just can't get people to use them, to buy them. Because like that private equity firm, they want to minimize costs. If you do regulation right, you create a market for security, which leads to innovation. Right? You regulate the outcome, and then there's innovation in achieving those outcomes. We see this in anti-pollution as well. So Europe is moving this direction. Right? The, the GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation, has strong privacy and security requirements and strong penalties. They have some IoT security as well. In the United States, it's the states that are leading the way. Most, most specifically, California, New York, and Massachusetts. Right, California has a comprehensive privacy law, an initial IoT security law modeled after, the, after Europe. New York is regulating cryptocurrencies. Massachusetts has a new right to repair law. We're seeing existing federal agencies getting involved. Less so in the past four years, uh, probably will start up again. FAA, DOT, FDA, FTC, so on. And I expect Congress will be the, sort of the last to follow. I think it's going to have to be some sort of disaster. We'll see if solar winds does something. My guess is it's not enough. And the international considerations are interesting here. Right? Software is right one cell everywhere. So, uh, I mean, right now, the car I buy in the United States is not the same car I buy in Mexico. We have different environmental laws, and the manufacturers will tune their engine to the different countries' laws. But the Facebook I get in the United States is exactly the same Facebook I get everywhere else because it's easier for them. And right, so California has a new IoT security law uh, passed, I think, last year, came into force this year. Uh, one of the provisions is no default password. If you want to sell an IoT device in California, it can't have a default password. So the manufacturer of a thermostat or a toy or a whatever is not going to maintain two software builds, one for California, one for the rest of us. They're going to update their software and sell it everywhere. My security will improve because of the California law, just like your security all improved because of GDPR in Europe. When GDPR was passed, I worked for IBM. IBM made a very public statement saying that we are going to implement GDPR worldwide because that is easier than figuring out who a European is. Right? Smart regulation in a few markets improves cybersecurity everywhere. 
And again, I don't see an alternative. There is an industry in the past 150 years that has improved safety or security without being forced to by the government. Let's list them. Cars, planes, pharmaceuticals, food production, medical devices, restaurants, consumer goods, workplace condition, most recently financial products. Government is how we step in and raise the standards for safety and security. So for us right now, I want to see technologists getting involved in policy. As internet security becomes everything security, internet security technology becomes more important to overall security policy. All of the security policy issues we face will have strong tech components. And we will never get the tech right if we get the I'm sorry, we'll never get the policy right if policymakers get the tech wrong. And we see that in the going dark debate, in the vulnerability equities debate, in voting machine security, driverless car security, AI fairness. And if you watch, I don't know, the Apple versus FBI debate, you saw policymakers and technologists talking past each other. If you watch the Facebook hearings from a few years ago, you saw policymakers with no idea how to possibly regulate technology. We need to fix this. Technologists need to get involved in policy discussions on congressional staffs and federal agencies at NGOs as part of the press. This is why I teach at the Harvard Kennedy School. Right? This is bigger than security, really. We need to build a world where there's a viable career path for public interest technologists. We need to do this or bad policy will happen to us. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, you can uh, type them into chat. You can unmute yourself if you have that power. All right, someone's asking in chat about the uh, authentications. Well, so the problem is we don't know how to secure thing to thing authentication at that scale. I mean, I don't, I, so you install, I'm going to make this up. A million road sensors on a highway that you communicate with each other and some central station. That's a lot of one-time tokens. Right? That requires human intervention. We're going to need a system that doesn't require human intervention. I mean, um, or imagine you're in a driverless car. It's going to have to authenticate in real time as it's driving to thousands of other cars and road signs and traffic alerts and possibly even human beacons. All in real time, all on demand, all ad hoc. We have no freaking clue how to do that. So it's the scale, but it's also the scope, and it has to be automatic. This is a serious problem we have, and it's an area of, 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 of ongoing research. Uh, early on in the, in the talk, um, you, you, talk, you, you mentioned this idea that everything's becoming a computer with something attached to it. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, I want to ask, what do you what do you think resists becoming a computer? Uh, at, at that's you know I don't know liquid gas uh, pretty much nothing. <laughs> right? I mean we're we're computerizing everything, and 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 you know it's economics as the cost of computers gets cheaper. You know we're starting to see embedded chips in clothing that are self-powered or environmentally powered and, and communicate. I mean, as these things drop to free, the marginal cost of computerizing something is, is lower. I mean, it, it's worth asking questions like, you know, why does your refrigerator come with the internet? Isn't that dumb? The reason is it's cheaper. So 20 years ago, if you were designing a refrigerator, you would create a custom, micro, custom controller chip for the refrigerator. And that's what you would do. You don't do that today. Today, you pull something off the shelf, a Raspberry Pi or some commercial uh, equivalent, and you write refrigerator software and put it on that chip. That chip has a video port, a micro port, an internet stack, has all of that built in. Right? It's all there. You might as well turn it on. This is why you have things like your Roomba can listen in on, on what's going on in the room, because it came with an audio port. It came with a microphone. So th the computerization is getting everywhere, driven by how cheap it is to put it in. Right? Toys, I mean, very cheap goods. 
So nothing's really resisting stuff you can't attach computers to, I guess, like liquid or gas. So the question about uh, policy versus technology, right now I think there is more technology than there is policy demand. So I think new technology needs to be invented, but we now have a, a technology glut and a policy uh, – uh, uh, what's the word? Not default. I'm blanking on the word. No, that's not. Less policy than we need, more tech than we need. Deficit, thank you. So that's where we are right now. I mean, there are that we do need we do need some new tech, but we really need policy. You know, the the market free fall isn't serving us well right now. So yeah, I'm liking seven by seven on Zoom. This is this is this is a new thing for me. What's a realistic path for getting into the policy side of things? So I. There, there are many paths. I maintain a page on public interest technologists. It's publicinteresttech.com with hyphens. Let me just type it into the uh, the chat right now. And I, in that, I uh, have everything I have found on public interest tech. And you know how people get into the field. There are a lot of different ways. Everything is unique. I, mean, I want to see a a big broad career path. We don't really have that yet. It's not like public interest law. But at the Harvard Law School, 20% of the graduating class doesn't go work for a law firm or a corporation. They go into public interest law, one-fifth. And a few years ago, Harvard Law had this soul-searching seminar because that percentage is so low. Number of computer science graduates going into uh, public interest tech, probably zero. And I think that is because we just don't have this ecosystem, which I'm trying to, to, to build. But right now, you have to force your way in. All right, I got a, a long uh, question about uh, uh, Moore's Law, quantum computing. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, I'm, I... I don't need any uh, encryption technologies right now. Right? I, uh, I have all the cryptography I, I need. Uh, quantum computing, I think, is likely to become real in the next decade. But NIST is already working on quantum-resistant algorithms, so we'll have those well ahead, I think, of, of the breaking. So I don't see uh, Moore's Law continuing ending quantum really as a game changer in any real extent. Uh, I wrote an essay on this. If you pull it up, it's called Cryptography After the Aliens Land. You can Google for that, which talks a bit about those technologies. Question about self-sovereign entity, going to be going to work. I don't know. I don't care. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem there. That That's one of those like weird libertarian solutions without a problem, like, like uh, blockchain, that I just, you know, if, if it just went away, that'd be great. So I so I don't I don't see self sovereign identity as to be anything useful. I don't have an identity uh, identity problem. I can open my wallet. I have any number of identity documents. They all work pretty well. No one's going to want to use anybody else's. Just like nobody wants to use anybody else's card in your wallet. So digital is likely to look, look the same as, as that. Any other questions? I get that we're all zoomed out. Is it the start of your semester too, or is it? Uh, are you on quarters? I don't. I don't know where you are in your semester. We're we're on quarters. We're at towards the beginning of of the academic quarter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do not use Linux, so I don't have an answer to which one I trust. Man, honestly, if I answer that, I would just Google it and find out which ones people trust. I, I mean, this is something about trust. Trust is social. You try. I you trust it because someone you know trusts it, or someone you trust trusts it. Now you're asking me because you kind of trust me. I don't know. I'll go to people I trust. I use Windows, which uh, some people think is odd. But I think if, I think you know, well tricked out Windows is the most secure operating system out there. Now. Hmm. 
so I, I think you you brought up the interesting point about trust being a kind of fundamentally a social issue. But do you think policy has um, uh, not leading? Okay, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um the uh yeah i guess you know that you know there's this desire to somehow build mechanisms that can can somehow solve these kinds of um social problems around trust you can't you know i and actually actually i wrote a book on this too this is a book i'm really actually proud of this is this is really a sociology book and it's all about trust in society called liars and outliers and and it turns out you can't build mechanisms to solve social problems like that I mean, you could do things to, 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 to lubricate. I mean, I can, we could have you all authenticate before you got onto this Zoom so we know that you as students paid for your class. But there's, there are social issues on the bottom of that. One of the reasons that, that uh, blockchain doesn't actually solve trust in any meaningful way. It just moves it around. And you, you see if any of those sort of trust solutions, they just move trust around. You have to trust different things in different ways. But in the end, trust is all human. I mean, you know, I mean, right? You download Linux, and how do you know that's the version of Linux that the person who trusted it used? And did they look at the source code? And how did you know that the source code was the right code? I mean, the, the, the Solar Winds hack, it seems like what the Russians did is they hacked the build process inside the company so that when the update was compiled, it included the back door. This is Ken Thompson's trusting trust essay from the 80s or 90s, whenever that was. So here you are, you write the software, you maybe you audit, you verify it, you look at it, you compile it, you get a backdoor. That's creepy. But that's the way trust works. Right? You have to trust every piece of the chain. You can't actually verify it. who has the time. And that can be attacked. It looks like we have another question here about the right to repair laws. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm in favor of right to repair. Basically, we are secure because researchers can look at software. And right to repair is really right to examine. And without a right to repair law, companies will have lousy security and rely on the law to make sure you don't notice. We learned this from computers in the 90s. We don't need to, we don't need to learn it again by the Internet of Things today. And if you want real security, researchers need to have access to the software. So laws that prevent that kind of access hurt us in the long term. So Massachusetts, there was, I mean, this, this was a, uh, a ballot initiative that, that passed uh, in, in November. And the auto manufacturers had this massive media blitz, how this would lead to, basically, I'm not making this up, women being attacked in dark parking lots. That's the way the advertising ran. Right? If, if we showed our software to you, the bad guys could get at it and hack it. Well, honestly, the bad guys are going to hack it anyway. You want the good guys to see it. And you want the auto manufacturers to fix it. If that's the problem, they shouldn't be selling the software. They shouldn't be able to hide behind a law that doesn't let people evaluate it. So right to repair is an extremely important part of gaining security. If I could uh, extend that question, I meant it not so much in a software context, but in a hardware context. You had talked about how compromised supply chains can lead to the introduction of hardware that has backdoors built in. And so the, the counter to right to repair might be that if we have closer control over who is allowed to open and modify the hardware of a device, then we can make it more secure that way. But, but the Russians would say that because that would mean we would not have learned about solar winds and they'd be able to be hacking governments around the world with impunity. I think solar winds was discovered because FireEye stared at the code of the update and figured out that there was a, uh, a back door in it. So right, this is how we as good guys get at. The bad guys figured it out on their own. They're not going to follow the law. It doesn't matter. The good guys follow the law. We need the law to allow them to have access. 
and and in general, I need ways that these uh, um, these chips can be made secure, even if they can't be updated. That's a bigger problem I need to solve, and I can't hide behind again making it illegal to look for vulnerabilities for security. It's too fragile. It's just not going to work. Same thing with voting machines. We need everybody to look at voting machine software. Because voting machine security is kind of sucky because they're hiding behind secrecy laws. Anything else? Happy to give you seven minutes of your life back. <laughs> I have learned this resumes that ending early makes everybody happy. Uh, this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, someday I'll be able to like get on an airplane and go places again. Yes, it would be great to have you visit in person. Be great to be anywhere. <laughs> thanks all. Enjoy your uh, enjoy your pandemic. Thank and you. Like, I will emerge in the summer stronger. All right. Thank you. Love your book, Secrets and Lies. Hey, thank you. <laughs>